We're coming up to two holidays. There's the 19th of Kislev, the day that the Al Rebbe was released from Tsarist imprisonment. And also, of course, Hanukkah at the end of the month. The 19th of Kislev is celebrated all over the world because it made the availability of Hasidus possible for the whole world. So here's the story. The first Lubavitcher Rebbe, Rabbi Schneir Zalman, 250 years ago, began to reveal some of the secrets of Torah. Obviously, secrets of Torah were not really meant to be revealed. So he was tampering with a heavenly law and heaven itself was uncomfortable with the idea. And so it turned out that in the, in the physical world, the king, the czar, arrests the Alter Rebbe, questions him, and eventually releases him saying it's fine. This is reflecting what was going on in heaven. The heavenly courts were debating whether what the Rebbe was doing was kosher, permissible, or not. And when in heaven it was decided that it was okay, then the czar here in this plane and on the physical level also decided to allow the Alter Rebbe to continue his teachings. Now, one of the accusations for which the Rebbe was imprisoned was that uh, the Rebbe was supporting the Turks against Russia. They were at war at the time, and um, the Rebbe was collecting large sums of money and sending it to Israel, to the Jews who lived there, who had a very hard time supporting themselves. And so the al Rebbe was supporting the Yishuv, the Jewish existence of the Jewish community in Israel. Of course, Israel then was under Turkish rule. So they contrived this whole scheme that the al Rebbe was really sending money to the Turks to support their efforts against Russia. Now, behind every lie, there has to be some grain of truth. They were saying that the al Rebbe is supporting the Turks against Russia so that the al Rebbe would eventually be anointed as king of Israel. The Turks would be grateful and they would give him that title or that position. So really what the al Rebbe wanted was to become the king of the world. Where is the grain of truth in that? Huh. The al Rebbe wanted to make God king of the world. That everyone should know that there is one king, the true king of kings, and that is God. When the Rebbe was released, it was considered a huge miracle. A very, very uncommon thing to happen. Once you're accused of treason, to be released and permitted to continue what you were doing before is, is nothing short of miraculous. So not only was the Rebbe allowed to continue to teach Hasidus to the Jewish community, but the Tsar and his ministers and the entire non-Jewish population also recognized that something very holy, something very godly was going on here. 
And that was the Rebbe's purpose, to make God known and beloved in, to, his, to his creations, to, the, to, the, to all humans. Now here's the question. Kabbalah is the secret of Torah. There are four dimensions. There's the literal meaning, the hinted meaning, and the moral meaning, and the secret meaning. What are the secret meanings of Torah? The Kabbalah. Now the Kabbalah had already been made public 200 years before the Alta Rebbe. in Israel by the Ari who proclaimed, who was a Kabbalist uh, of his time and he proclaimed that the time had come that this inspiring dimension of the Torah should be made public. There was some controversy back then, there were those who were against it, but it had already become an established fact that you may study Kabbalah, it is no longer restricted the way it had been before. We don't find that the Ari was accused of tampering with the secrets of Torah. The Maharal of Prague also taught Kabbalah. Nobody complained. But when the Baal Shem Tev started teaching Hasidus, and the Alter Rebbe opened it up to the public and explained it and made it accessible to the average person. Here there was a complaint in heaven that the secrets are being squandered. What was it that was so secret in the teachings of, the, of, the, of Chabad that uh, it caused that kind of a stir? The Rebbe was in prison for 53 days, corresponding to the 53 chapters of the Tanya, the first book written by the Rebbe on Chabad teachings. So he sat a day in jail for every chapter of the Tanya. This would mean that every chapter was in some way violating the code that said that the secrets of Torah must remain, must remain secret. Now, if you look in the Tanya, it doesn't seem to be anything so controversial or so, um, so otherworldly that it mustn't be revealed. It seems like pretty common sense stuff. How to be good, how to overcome your evil inclination, how to elevate your animal soul. Well, that you have an animal soul, that you have a godly soul and you have to, there's a battle between them. Where is the secret that must never be shared? Huh? So let's understand what secret means. Why would Torah have a secret dimension? And if it is secret, why do you tell us about it? A person who really knows how to keep a secret is somebody who is so, uh, so secretive that you don't know that he has a secret. A person who can't really keep a secret, he may not tell you what the secret is, but somehow he lets you know that he has a secret that he can't tell. So if there really is a secret part of Torah, why does the Torah itself tell us that there's a secret part? And then when you look at the secret part of Torah, whether it's the Kabbalah or Hasidus, it, it doesn't seem to be justified. What, what is the secret? It's beautiful, it's wonderful, not dangerous. Why is it a secret? So here's the idea. 
secret part of Torah doesn't mean no one must know. Even by a human being, what is it you keep secret? Dangerous information? Not everybody has dangerous information in their lives, unless you're a spy for the CIA or for the Mossad or for the KGB. You, know, you don't have secrets. The secret part of your life is the personal, intimate part of your life. It's secret not because no one must know. It's because you reserve it for your inner life, not for your social life. It belongs inside the home, not outside the home. What happens in Vegas? <laughs> In other words, some things are just a little too personal to share with people who may not appreciate the beauty of it. So if you tell your best friend something really personal about yourself, you've shared a secret. Does that mean that he can now go and tell everybody what you told him? Because it's not a secret anymore. He told you. He shared a secret, and it remains a secret. When I tell you something personal about myself, it doesn't make it any less personal. So if you can't treat it with the same sensitivity that I treat it, I will never tell you a secret again. If you don't preserve the beauty and the, and the uh, modesty of the secret, then I can't tell you the secret. But if you know how to keep a secret, then I will share it with you. And if you find someone to share it with properly, in other words, they too will respect the, per, the, the intimacy of it, you can do that. So. I can have a secret that everybody knows, my whole community. But they treat it with respect. And with, I mean, you get married, everybody knows you're going to have an intimate relationship. It's not a secret. Yet, nobody is going to ask you what goes on in your private life. Because they're treating it with respect with dignity. So a secret doesn't mean no one can know. The secret means only those who appreciate what a secret is may be informed, may be included in the secret. So in the olden days, the Kabbalah was the secret part of Torah and only the most sensitive, the most intuitive, the most refined among the scholars, among the sages. Not every sage. Because being a sage was not enough. You also had to have this appreciation for the, the privacy and the intimacy of the secret part of Torah. It stands to reason that the most intimate and the most secret part of Torah is the most inspiring. What inspires you? What brings you closer to God than God sharing with you something really private about himself? And that's what it means in the Song of Songs. My beloved takes me into his chamber, brings me into his palace, whatever the expressions are, what does it mean, bring me into the palace? It means reveal something personal. So if we could uh, have a glimpse at those more personal and more intimate parts of God's will and God's wisdom, that would certainly inspire us with a closeness to God, 
a love for God, an awe for God. Whereas if all we hear are the technical do's and don'ts, obviously that's not as inspiring. That's why 400 years ago, the Ari in Tzvas, in Israel, the Kabbalist, said that the circumstances in which we find ourselves demands a new source of inspiration, and that is the secret part of Torah, and it should now be made available to everyone. Partly out of desperation, and partly because we could better handle it. Briefly, the idea is like this. The desperation we can understand. The exile had gone on way too long. The memory of the event at Sinai was fading and disappearing consciously. Even memory of the temple that stood that Solomon built was a long time ago. The sages of the Talmud, long time ago. We're really coming to the end of our rope and we don't know where to get our inspiration from to not only remain Jewish, but to be inspired by our, by our Jewishness. And so out of desperation, we have to dig deeper into the Torah, into God's revelation, to find a new reservoir of inspiration for our, for, for our performance of mitzvahs and for our service of God. So that desperation made it necessary to reveal the secret. And what is the danger? The danger is that you will reveal it to people who are callous, who are a little jaded, and they won't appreciate it. It's really like parents don't tell their children how desperately they need their children mm -hmm. to be good. We don't reveal that. We tell them they're supposed to be good, that they get us angry when they're not good. We're going to take them out of the will. We're going to but we don't reveal the real secret, how desperately we need our children to be good, not good to us, just good people. When we get desperate because our child is really going off the deep end, then we let it all out. Then we cry our heart out. What are you doing to me? You have no idea how painful this is. I can't see you being, you know, being so corrupt and whatever. And usually the children are surprised. They never suspected that you felt so strongly about this. Why don't we reveal it? We're afraid that they'll laugh. We're afraid that they'll take it wrong. They'll see it as a weakness. So we don't say it unless we're desperate. But then there are those children who are so good and so tuned in to their parents that the parents never, sus never suspect that the child will not appreciate their secrets. And so they can share their secrets with those children, confident that the child will take it right. They won't see it as a weakness in the parent, but as a moral sensitivity. Same is true with God. Until we're desperate, there's the possibility that if God shows his vulnerability, that we might lose respect. So what kind of God is this? So instead of appreciating that ultimate vulnerability comes from strength and it's not a weakness at all, 
On the contrary, it's a beautiful sensitivity. So in desperation, the Ari said, we're going to reveal this secret. And some people are going to take it wrong. And some people are going to become worse. Because now that you've shared the entire secret and they're not impressed, there's really not much left to inspire them with. There's also the possibility of repentance and of tshuva. If God told us right up front the full extent of his vulnerability, how he desperately, he needs us to be good. And we weren't good. Where would the justification for forgiveness come from? But if he doesn't reveal the full extent and we don't obey his commandments, he can forgive us. He can justify our sinning on the grounds that, that he never really told us how important it is. So that's why for a long time in history, the, reveal, the, the secret part of Torah was not revealed. But when you're desperate, you reveal it. Also, what does it mean we are desperate? It means we don't appreciate holiness for its own sake. We don't appreciate spiritual stuff. We don't understand uh, right from wrong. We don't even understand what commandment means. So what's left? That's you have you have a, a a father who is an absolute genius, awesome, awesome genius. The kids don't understand what he's talking about. E equals M C squared. I don't know what you're talking about. It's gibberish. So they have no respect for their father's intelligence. They have no respect for their father's writings, for his theories, for his brilliance. They don't appreciate it. They tried, they read it, they don't get it. And, and they dismiss it. But when the father calls them together and says, I need you, I'm not feeling well. They all come running. In other words, when it's the father himself who needs the child, every child will respond. When the father tries to be the teacher, the mentor, the inspiration, it doesn't work. Because the children are not as intelligent as the father. So here's what happens. As we lose our understanding and our talents in Torah. We're not the scholars that we used to have. We don't understand. We can't even imagine the holiness of a holy temple or of prophets delivering the word of God to people. We can't even imagine what that's like. So the things that used to inspire us go right over our heads. We don't understand. We don't get it. But when you come to people and say, you don't know what tefillin are, you don't know the importance of Shabbos, but he desperately needs you to do it. I hear you. That I can relate to. Precisely because I don't understand his writings, I don't understand his genius, but him, that always gets to me because I am his, I'm his. So if he's my father in heaven and he needs something from me, of course, of course. Will I now better understand his theory of relativity? <laughs> no, no. So the generation that is desperate 
is also the generation that can be inspired by him and not something about him. So we're not inspired by heaven. We're not intimidated by hell. We don't know those things. But the secret of Torah is he depends on us for this. That I can hear, that I can relate to, and I will do the mitzvah for him. That's the secret part of Torah. That's what was revealed in Hasidus, and that's what inspired the last generations before the coming of Mashiach. Now, very quickly, Hanukkah is the same idea. Jews were living Jewish lives in Israel with the temple. Things were great, but pretty much on the surface. What happened in the miracle of Hanukkah, if you remember, the Greeks contaminated all the oil. The Jews eventually prevailed, and they came to light the menorah, and all there was was contaminated oil. And a miracle happened. They found a little cruise of oil that was only enough for one night or one day lighting, and it lasted for eight days until they were able to make new oil. What was the miracle? The miracle was that the Jews at that time did not use the available oil, the contaminated oil, which was permissible. They went looking for oil that had never been contaminated. In simple language, on the revealed level of Jewish life, they could have used the contaminated oil and it would have been okay. But on the secret part of Torah, in other words, the personal intimate part of Torah, something in the inside, the secret part of the Jews did not allow them to compromise and use contaminated oil. They dug deep and they found the oil that is never contaminated, can't be contaminated. It's the secret part of Torah that is always inspiring and it's always pure. And what is that? The more intimate connection that we have to God, the inner motivation for doing his commandments. And that's what it means. They found an, a, a cruise of oil that still had the seal. It was still secret. It was untouched, unblemished. So Hanukkah celebrates the same idea that we got past the surface. We contacted the, in, the inner stirrings of our soul that corresponds to the inner stirrings of God's soul. And uh, we perform the mitzvah on the purest level. Shalom Aleichem. How are you? You know, I do a lot of talking a lot of Zooming, many classes, many subjects, but that's all formal stuff. Hopefully good stuff, but formal. We also have a Wednesday night meeting that's more informal and kind of um, Hamish. If you want to join us for that kind of an event, um, interactive, time for questions, and so on. If you want to join us for this side of conversation, click on the link below and join us every Wednesday night at 9 o'clock. Well, maybe not every Wednesday night, but we try to make it every Wednesday night at 9 o'clock, a more informal chat, which... Uh, can be more enjoyable at times than the formal stuff. So check it out. Click on the link and join us. Try it. You'll like it.